Hi everyone, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Uh, you're watching part of our 16 week uh, Woodworking 101 class. It's uh, 16 weeks of lessons on all of the basics that you need to become a woodworker. Uh, for lesson number one, we have decided to break that up into eight small subsections because there's going through all of the tools that are needed for uh, the woodworker and kind of getting the highlights of each one is a little bit tedious. So I just thought I'd break it up into eight small sections. So this is just the next section uh, in, that, uh, in that lesson number one. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Next we're gonna talk about the router. The router is probably the most versatile tool in your wood shop if you're a woodworker. Uh, a router can put profiles like uh, decorative edges, roundovers and chamfers on, um, on the edge of your work. You can use a router to cut dados. You can use a router to uh, joint the edge of your boards. You can even use a router to plane a board flat. Uh, you can use a router to drill holes. Uh, a router is a very versatile tool. So you definitely need a router. If you, if you get a router, depending on your budget, uh, there's some options that you can look at. Uh, the standard router that most people get is uh, is something like this. If you are on a pretty limited budget, then ideally you would get a plunge router. And we'll talk about what that is in a minute. If you um, have a little bit more money, then you might get something like this system here. This router, you wanna hand me that base there? So this router is, uh, is a combination. The motor comes out. This is a fixed base. And we use this for a lot of handheld routing. And this is a plunge base. And the same router fits both uh, the fixed base and the plunge base. Let me see which way to put it in here. All right. And so a plunge router is pretty handy because a lot of times you'll need to make a plunge cut, cut down into your material and then move it over and let, let it come back up. And we'll talk about why that's important as well. But if you get a, you can get a combo kit like this, which is pretty reasonable, uh, a mid-power router, maybe one and a half to two, two and a quarter, two and a half horsepower, somewhere in that range. And the combo kit's great. If you have a little more money, you might consider getting a trim router. A trim router is pretty handy for a lot of things as well. Uh, but a router of this power could also even be turned upside down and put into a router table and used. Uh, so we'll go ahead and talk about some of the features uh, of the router and why it's a good tool to have. So when we're first putting in a router bit, there's a couple things to be aware of. When you put the router bit in, you don't necessarily want to bottom the router bit all the way out. This is the collet, and the collet basically tightens down and will hold this shank. It'll grip this shank tight. But if you put the router bit all the way down, the shank is going to stop at this point. If you look carefully, you can see there's a curve here what, from the cutter head to where the shank starts, a little bit of a curve, and some of the paint also comes down on this. So if you push this router bit in all the way and then begin tightening this collet down, the collet is going to actually just tighten on this upper portion and not along the whole length of the shank, and then you're gonna have a weak bit that could potentially come out. So I like to put the router bit in and then lift the router bit up just a little bit, maybe an eighth of an inch, and then tighten down the, uh, the collet. So if you look, once I've got this secured down here, I can actually see some of the silver part of the shank before that curve and before the paint, and I've tightened it down. So now I know that my collet has a really strong grip on that router bit. Most modern router bits are gonna be carbide, which means this portion here, this is carbide that's been brazed onto the cutter head. And carbide is extremely sharp, very hard, very durable. It's much more durable than, say, a bit that was made entirely of high-speed steel. And this is the preferable bit. I don't recommend that you just go out and buy a whole bunch of bits. What, what I've done is, over the years that I've been doing woodworking is I buy a bit and uh, only when a project calls for it. So if I'm doing a project and the project happens to need chamfering or something like that, I'll go out and buy a chamfering bit. I do another project in a few months that requires a certain bit, I'll go buy the bit that fits that. And then as time goes by, you'll gradually build up a good collection of bits at that point in time. But when you do, it's a good idea to try to invest in better quality bits. Uh, this bit is a half inch shank, which is what most of my bits are, which is the shank diameter, which is half inch. Um, if you have something smaller, for example, like a trim router, a uh, trim router will take uh, quarter inch shank bits. So 
the shank on that, you can see the collet in here is a little bit smaller. So it'll take smaller diameter bits. So you just need to be aware of what size collet you have so you'll know what size router bits to buy. Another thing that uh, most of the router bits that work uh, cutting a profile along the edge of uh, a board will have a bearing, a ball bearing at the top. And it's important to maintain this ball bearing so it doesn't go bad. This is uh, an oiler that you can buy for your ball bearing router bits and you basically will oil them. You just, just takes a, makes a little drop of oil here and you just put the oil in there and then make sure the oil gets inside of the bearing. And if you periodically do that, uh, then you'll dramatically extend the life of your bearings and your router bits will, will last virtually forever if you take care of them like that. So I want to talk about some uh, a good thing to practice with your router. Uh, essentially, this is the router table. This the, the table, the flat part here, needs to stay flat with your wood at all times. Oftentimes, you're cutting along the edge of your wood, and you're going to cut off of the edge. You want to cut with the router bit all the way to the edge, which means your table is going to be sticking off the edge. So when you do this, you'll need to practice keeping it straight. That's a very common error to be routing this way and you reach the edge and you tend to let it fall. If we let it fall like this, we're going to destroy our cut. So it's a good idea to just take a router, take some scrap wood and practice. Practice cutting straight off the edge. You can pretend that you're just going to keep going forever right off the edge and just keep it straight. Another thing that's critical is keeping it flat the whole way this way, meaning we don't want to cut like this and we don't want to cut like that. I'm exaggerating those a little bit obviously, but it's very easy to get into routing and pushing down so hard and trying to concentrate so much that you kind of lose track of the balance point. So once you have practiced this for a while, you'll get a good feel of where the flat point is and you'll be able to maintain a nice, maintain a nice flat cut all the way across and you'll be able to maintain a nice flat cut all the way past an edge. Well, let's go make a little practice cut here and see how this goes. I want to point out a little safety issue that not a lot of people think about, but it can come back to bite you. Sometimes we don't know if this is on or off when we're about to use it. So I never really could remember if it was the line or the circle that was on or off, or I may think it was off and it's not, and I'm not looking at this. This router has a lot of torque, and the bigger the router, the more torque it has. So if you plug this thing in and your router is turned on, I gotta let that noise die. So if you plug this thing in and the router's turned on, it'll have enough torque to jump and possibly fall down, hit you, hit somebody else, or hit the ground, destroy your bit, something like that. So I always make my kids and everybody who works in the shop with me, I make them keep a hand on the router before they plug the router in, just in case it's accidentally turned on. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and make a sample cut. So this here is a chamfer bit, and we'll take a look and see what kind of a cut this chamfer bit leaves. So when we start this cut, zoom down under here, when we start this cut, I wanna be away from the wood. I don't wanna start the cut with the bit already engaged to the wood, and we can probably see the rotation of the bit is this way. So when the rotation of the bit is this way, we're gonna cut from left to right. We want the cutter to cut into the wood. I'm gonna go ahead and make that cut here. And that's the typical profile from a chamfer cut. Okay, so I just want to mention one more time about the rotation of the cut. So most routers will have their bit where they rotate clockwise like this. And that would be clockwise as if you're looking down from the top of the cutter head. <clears throat> it's going clockwise. And so what that means is you can see how the cutter head is going to cut into the wood. So what we have to do is we have to move the cut or the router from left to right. So that cut is digging into the wood as we cut like this. What you don't want to do if the rotation is this way is we don't want to start here and cut this way because then the router might catch and then it starts running this way and the router can run away from you. This particular cut cutting in this direction is called a climb cut 
And there are times that we'll use a climb cut, which I will discuss later when we get to that in the course. But at this point, just know that you always want to cut when the board is in front of you. You always want to cut and the rod is in front of the board. Sorry. You always want to cut from left to right. So you always want to cut so the rotation of the bit cuts into the wood. So a lot of times we'll also need to do a flush trim cut. So if we take a look at this board here, if these are two boards that I had joined and I wanted them to be the exact same thickness or the exact same distance out here, that's what this does. This flush trim bit will trim this top board to be flush with the bottom board. And I'm going to show you how this works. This is a very popular bit and we use this a lot in woodworking. So I'll show you how this cuts. So down here, I need to make sure that the bit is low enough in the router so that the bearing is going to ride on my guide surface, which is down here. And my cutter is going to ride on this surface. So it's going to cut the cutter, the cutter, I'm sorry, is going to cut this board down flush with this board because the bearing and this are the same diameter. So I'm going to make that cut. Okay, so I just kind of started here and ended there so you could see the difference. This board overhangs quite a bit. It did originally, and now they're both perfectly flush. And that's the benefit of a flush trim router bit. I'll show you how to use the plunge function. Uh, this is a pretty important function. So if you get a plunge router, this is what you'll use. Uh, most plunge routers, they have a lever here and you can squeeze this lever and that will allow you to plunge the router down. You plunge it down to whatever depth, whatever depth that you want. You let go of the lever and it locks the router at that particular plunge depth. Now we can control the plunge depth in a number of ways. One is with this adjustment rod. So we can move this adjustment rod up and down to a point where we like it. And then the bottom of this adjustment rod will meet on one of these different surfaces here. So if I release this, I can pick how deep I want it to go. If I want the plunge to stop there, it stops there where the rod meets. If I want to go deeper than that, I might rotate this down a notch and stop there. If I want to go deeper than that, maybe a couple more notches, and you can see it's going to stop all the way down there. And that's going to, the further down I go, the more that's going to cause this thing to plunge beneath the surface. Okay, so I'm just going to do a, a quick sample plunge cut and kind of show you how it works here. And I've set up, uh, I'm pretending that I've got a, I want to plunge uh, this piece out here. Maybe this is going to be for a mortise, for a rail. Uh, it could be for a lot of things. And I've got my straight edge back there that I'm going to need to keep the router against. So when we cut, we'll need to keep the router against that point. And this will plunge down and it's going to make a cut along here, basically. So, and I'm just going to stop it manually at the line over here and at the line over here. Uh, if you need a more precise cut, sometimes you'll put a board here to stop it and a board here to stop it or some sort of a clamp down there to stop it. And we'll take a look and we'll give this a shot here, see how it goes. I don't know if you could see there, but it was actually very easy to stop right on the lines. And all I had to do is make sure I held the edge of the router back against my guide and I made a plunge. So if you want a mortise, obviously it'll need to be deeper than this, but the best way to do it is to take these plunges in steps. You want to go down maybe an eighth of an inch at a time until you reach whatever depth that you're trying to achieve. And that's sort of the value of a plunge router, the ability to make mortises. So another bit that I want to talk about is a rabbiting bit. A rabbiting bit is a bit that allows you to put a rabbit at the edge of a board, like down here for example, 
And that's good for bookcase construction, cabinet construction, things like that. And I'll demonstrate what the profile of the rabbiting bit looks like. These also have a bearing. Some of these have adjustable, are adjustable where you can put different size bearings on here so you can have rabbits of different depths. But I'll show you the way this one's set up right now, how it works. And so you see the rabbit here that this makes. And if you look at the edge here, you can see when I held the router, I started to walk the router backwards instead of going straight off the edge. It was a little hard if the camera gets in the way or something, but that's something you should practice not to let that happen. Just try to shoot straight off the edge so your rabbit stays clean. If you're gonna go around the corner, it's no problem. But if you just want a straight rabbit, then this would be a minor error. But that's what the rabbiting bit does. Here again too, if you need a rabbit that's deeper than this, it's best to cut it in a couple of passes. And this is a, uh, one more very useful router bit to have in your collection. Just to recap, we'll take a quick look at these router bits again. This is a basic set that I think would be important uh, for most woodworkers. And beyond this set, you might want to wait until you have a project that requires a specific bit. Uh, but this one's a chamfer bit which we saw that puts a chamfer on the edge profile. Uh, this is a roundover, which we didn't actually demonstrate, but you can see that it will make a rounded profile on the edge. So either you want a chamfer or a roundover sometimes. And of course there are many decorative edge profile bits too. This was a flush trim router bit with the bearing up here. This allows us to trim two boards, or one board so that it's perfectly flush with another. Uh, this is our straight cutter. This is the type of bit that we would use to make a mortise uh, or a dado in the middle of a board. And this is our rabbiting bit. This allows us to put a rabbit at the edge of a board. And this is a pretty good collection. I got these from Rockler. This is a Freud bit. Um, you can actually find all of these on Amazon. And uh, this is a good collection to start with. And that kind of wraps up the router. Hi everybody, I wanted to say thank you very much for watching. And I have made a, a couple of small changes. Uh, I've decided to take the first video, the first lesson of the 16 week course and break it into eight subsections. When I got done filming it and I got done editing it, it was pretty long, it was about an, almost an hour and a half and I thought that was too much for anybody to sit through. So I just broke that down into eight categories, one for each uh, subsection. I'm gonna try to post one each day. So one, this one's coming up now and then I'll do one each day until they're all out and then we'll try to go, you know, one video per week after that. Okay, so one other thing is that we talk about a lot of tools in this uh, lesson number one, and I just wanted you to have access or to know what each of these tools are. These are the tools that I use every day in my shop, and I have uh, composed a list of all of these tools and links where they can be bought at the best price, and I'll keep a list of that or a copy of that in the description. I'll also have the list in a downloadable, like a PDF format, which I'll put up on my website. Uh, that's for anybody to download who's interested in having a copy of that. Once again, I want to say thank you for watching. I hope you found some valuable information in this. I know going through all of the, the tools can be a little bit tedious, but uh, the course should definitely pick up and get a lot more exciting uh, once we get into that. So thanks again, and we'll see you next video.